Hey everyone, this is Daniel for Rock the JVM, and you are watching a tutorial on how to scaffold full stack Scal3 applications with the type level stack. So this video is going to be a tutorial on how to build a full stack Scal app from scratch with minimal features with cats, cats infect, and a bunch of other libraries in the ecosystem. So the assumptions are that you have some solid knowledge of Scala, of course, and some basic knowledge of cats effect and cats and some other libraries in the type level ecosystem, including Doobie and HTTP4S. We have a couple of videos here on the Rock the JVM channel detailing those. And I'm also going to leave a GitHub repository in the description of this video if you want to take a look at the code that I'm going to write in this video. And also with a start tag that you can use to start from almost scratch and write along with this video, which is the best way that you can make the most out of this little video. I'm also going to write a tutorial on the blog, which is blog.rockthegvm.com. You can find this on the description as well. This tutorial contains some of the basic ideas behind my giant course, which is called the Type Level Rite of Passage. This is one of my biggest courses on Rock the JVM. It shows you how to build a production grade full stack Scala 3 application, including the front end, which we are also going to scaffold in this video. So if you want to check out this big course, I also left a link in the description. All right, so without further ado, I'm gonna show you the repository that I have ready for you, and we can get started to write some code. Now for this tutorial, I recommend that you have Docker installed on your computer because we're going to spin up a local Postgres instance, which we are going to use to write some data to it. So I'm gonna navigate to the DB folder, and under DB, I'm gonna hit docker-compose up, and uh, this will spin up a local Postgres instance. And then I'm going to open up another terminal because we're going to operate both on the back end and on the front end. All right. So in our build.spt, we have obviously all the library dependencies here. So we have a core set of dependencies which contains JVM and JS settings. The common project here is going to contain shared code between the front end and the back end. We're going to check that out shortly. We have the front end which contains just a couple of libraries, including Tyrion, which is a very nice little library for a uh, front end based on Cat's Effect and uh, a couple of uh, Cat's Effect based uh, libraries, including FS2 and Leica, which we are going to use to render different stuff. And on the back end, on the server project, we have many more libraries, including Cat's Effect, HTTP4S, Doobie, and whatnot. You don't need to care about the build SBT too much. Only that we have three separate projects here. One is called server, one is called common, and one is called app. Server is for backend, common is for shared code, and app is for the front end. That's it. Now, for server, we don't have any sort of code, so I'm going to create my server source directory. So I'm going to have a new folder. I'm going to say source main scala com rock the jvm, let's say live demo. And uh, here under this live demo thing, I'm going to hit a little playground app. So I'm going to have new Scala object, object, let's call this playground. And on the playground, I'm going to hit up a main function. So um, def main args array string. And this is going to return unit, of course. And I'm going to say print line backend up. And um, I'm going to save this whole thing. And after I've defined the main method, I should be able to run this. Uh, by the way, I'm using metals here for this video. You can also use IntelliJ. They also, both of them run just fine. So I'm gonna hit run method. Look at that, we have backend up. All right, cool. So we have the playground. Now, the first thing that I'm going to do in this full stack application is to define a layer that is going to interact with the database. And the database currently just contains a little db.sql, and this is run automatically. So if you open up another terminal here, I am going to do db, for example, and uh, actually not this one. I'm going to name this one db, and I'm going to do docker ps, and uh, docker ps says I have a bunch of containers here. It's called db db1 for whatever reason, and I'm going to do docker exec dash it, this whole thing. And I'm going to say p sql dash capital u docker. This is going to be the username that I'm going to use to interact with the Docker container with the database. And uh, in the default database, I should have access to a table that I have that I call jobs because this application, or rather the application that I create in the type of variety passage, is a jobs board that you can use to apply and whatnot, search and uh, 
uh, filter and whatever. And uh, I trimmed this down to just one table that we call jobs. This has a bunch of details. ID, company, title, description, external URL, sal salary low, salary high, currency, remote, uh, location, and country. So th these are the details for our fictitious job platform. We do have a real job platform on Rock the JVM. Not too many people are using it though, but uh, it is up in there, up and running. Um, so I'm going to say select star from jobs. And look at that, we have a little jobs table. Looks kind of crappy because the window is quite narrow, but I do have a little entry in the table, which is this little job which is called Rock the JVM Instructor, Scholar Teacher, RockTheJVM.com. By this point, you probably know that would be me. Okay, so this db.sql has some data, and I'm going to show you how to interact with this database and uh, uh, perform some basic operations. All right, so under this live demo thing, I'm going to create a new package. So I'm going to create a new folder. I'm going to call this core. Now, under the core, I designed the application to contain the business logic of the app as well as the main modules that make the app work. For example, a module that will allow us to interact with jobs. Additionally, I'm going to create a new folder that I'm going to call domain. And in domain, I'm going to define the basic data structures that will define the business of my app. And in this case, I'm going to define uh, a little object that I'm going to call job. So I'm going to create an object and I'm going to call this job with a lowercase j. So this is kind of going to be like a package uh, that is going to be used for me to uh, organize my case classes. And in my case, I'm going to navigate to my DB SQL and uh, I'm going to take all these fields. And uh, these are going to be the fields of a case class that I'm going to call job, of course. And uh, these are going to be my fields. Company is going to be a string. Title is going to be a string. Description is going to be a string. External URL is going to be a string. Salary low, I'm just going to have an option int. I've got a comma. Salary high, again, an option int. All right. Then currency, option, string, remote, this is going to be a Boolean. So it's going to be by default, probably false. Location is going to be a string and country may be a string. So I'm going to have an option string for country. All right, so this is going to be my little case class. Hopefully that matches what we have in the database. Company title, description, external URL, salary level, salary high, currency, remote, location, text, not null. So these are non-optional. Salary low, salary high, currency, and country are all optional, which is what matches in the data in the case class as well. So this is going to be my case class. All right. Now, once I define my domain model, obviously you can define a companion object, you can define utility methods, and uh, I'm going to have a little uh, object job. For example, I'm going to have a valid dummy, and this is going to be dummy as a job with the details that I have in my DB SQL, for example. So this is going to be this whole thing where the strings are not single quotes, but in double quotes, because we're in a real programming language, folks. So this is going to be rock the JVM instructor, scholar teacher, rock the JVM.com, 099, euro true, okay. Now for the optionals, I'm going to have some. So this is going to be these guys wrapped in a sum. So sum zero, sum 99, sum euro, true, Bucharest, and Romania is going to be a sum as well. So this is going to be a little country. Okay, that's my country, the country that you are listening from right now. Okay, so this is going to be little job case class with some companion object with some utility methods. Maybe you have an empty job and whatever. Okay, the first layer or the first core module that I'm going to add to this backend is going to be a layer that will interact with the jobs table. So once I define my domain that's relevant to my little app, I'm going to define a new Scala file. I'm going to call this a trait, and this is going to be a jobs module. I'm going to call this jobs plural so that we know what we're referring to. This is a so-called algebra. Algebra meaning that all the functionality that this jobs trait will expose are algebraic effects. That's why we're using cat's effect for this backend. Now, the structure of a core module would look something like this. Let me create a dummy one. So I'm going to create a little trait. I'm going to call this dummy. And I'm going to show you the general structure of a core module. This dummy would be typed with a type parameter f, which would be itself generic. So we're using the so-called 
tactless final style, although it has very little to do with the actual mathematics of tagless final, but it's historically named tagless final. And uh, the trait would offer some sort of API, for example, an action, which takes an argument as an int, and this would return an effect wrapping some other value. So this f would designate a kind of effect. That's what the type constructor f means. And um, the implementation would be a class, let's call this dummy live f, which is, again, generic, and this would satisfy some constraints or rather some descriptions via type class implicit parameters. For example, this would be an applicative. This is just an example. Applicative from cat's effect. So, uh, from cat, sorry. So, I'm going to import cat's star, and uh, I'm going to import uh, cat's syntax all star for whatever extension methods my, we might need, and this extends dummy f. So, this dummy f and uh, I would override this, so I would override the action. For example, I would return an f string like called an action with the arg arg, and then I would wrap this in a pure because the applicative type class allows us to wrap regular values in effects, so this would be a pure f. Now, the pure method is an extension method on any value. This is given by the cat syntax all import. So this is the general structure of a core module. We would expose some API, and uh, all the API methods would expose effectful operations. And the class would obviously override those. And depending on the capabilities that we need, we would modify this type class to be something stronger. Maybe a monad, maybe a monad error, maybe a concurrent from cat's effect, maybe a sync or... or things like that. All right. And I would also expose an object called dummy live, and I would expose an effectful creation. So I would make this constructor private, obviously with uh, some constructor arguments if we need to, and I would create or expose a little method called make or resource. So this would create a make with an F, which is an applicative. And this is going to be a new dummy, dummy, live f, pure f. And uh, this would expose an effectful value. So this is going to be an f of dummy f. And the reason for that is that whenever you instantiate core modules, this might uh, allocate some resources or this might produce side effects, which is why it's good practice to wrap all the creation in effectful versions or... So this is going to be a smart, effectful constructor. This is a smart constructor or a resource constructor. In the form of, let's call this uh, resource, resource f, which is again an applicative. And uh, this is going to be a resource from cat's effect. So I would import that. Resource has two type parameters. One is the uh, type, uh, effect type itself and the value type, which is dummy f. And uh, here you would create a uh, safely closable resource in the cat's effect terminology. And uh, for more uh, details about that, you can check out the other videos on cat's effect or the giant cat's effect course where I discuss this in more detail. So this is going to be resource, resource.pure. And uh, I would do a new dummy live f, for example. And with resources, you can compose them, you can close the resources as you see fit. So these are the two options for how to build a core module, either as a smart, effectful constructor or as a resource, and then you can compose them and use them the values as you want. So this is the general structure of a core module, which is what we're going to use to replicate in the jobs core module. Now, in the trade jobs, what do we need to expose in terms of API? For example, I would like to define a method to create, to create a job. So job, job, this is going to be an F of UUID. This is going to be the ID of the job that has just been created and a method to return all the jobs, for example. So all, and this is going to return F of list job. Now, obviously jobs, this is going to have a generic type parameter F, which is itself generic. By the way, if you want to have metals uh, keep on compiling your code, you can open up a new terminal window. I'm going to call this backend compile, and uh, I'm going to run an SBT here. Metals will also compile your code and give you compilation issues, but uh, sometimes it's just 
a little bit slow or type hints disappear completely. So I'm going to rely on SBT. So I'm gonna do project server and I'm gonna do it till the compile. And right now we have a compiler, a couple of compiling errors because we don't have access to the job case class. So I'm going to import from comruck the JVM and uh, this is gonna be my live demo domain and I'm going to import uh, from the job, job star. And uh, this gives me access to my case classes. All right, so this is the so-called algebraic definition because all the methods return algebraic effects, which we can compose as necessary. And my class uh, jobs live, jobs live, this is gonna be an F which has some type class uh, requirements here. I'm going to skip that for now. And uh, this is going to be something that interacts with the database. So I'm going to use a transactor, transactor, as a transactor F. Transactor, it comes from Duby. So Duby util transactor. I will also import a couple of things. I'm going to import cat's effect. I'm also going to import uh, Duby, Duby implicits, because Duby has a bunch of utility methods and custom interpolators and whatever. And I'm also going to import Duby Postgres implicits because we're using Postgres here. And uh, we have transactor here, which is what we need. So we have transactor, which is a transactor F. All right. And this extends jobs F. All right. Now I'm going to override both of these methods currently with just empty and uh, let me go implement these so the all method is just a select star from the jobs table so this is going to be a sql interpolator i'm going to use triple quotes here and i'm going to say select and i will need to have all the columns in the same order so i'm going to do i'm going to navigate to my db sql i'm going to take all the columns and I'm gonna play paste them here. So company, title, description, external, whatever. And uh, this is gonna be from the jobs table, all right? Then I'm gonna say dot query of type job. Then I'm gonna say dot stream, transact, stream, transact on the transactor. And then I'm going to say compile because this is an FS2 stream. So compile to list. Now, these are not available to us unless we have some uh, type class requirement here, which in our case is going to be concurrent. So let me go save that and look at that. The compile to list methods magically appeared. So we'd still have a success here. So this is just a select star from the jobs table. And uh, the create method is going to have a SQL triple quote. Hopefully I haven't put too many triple quotes here. And this is gonna be an insert into jobs and I'm gonna paste the exact same columns. And I'm gonna have values, all right. And I'm going to have the same fields here except I'm going to have the job itself. So I'm going to inject job dot, these suckers, All right? So job company, title, description, external URL, whatever. And uh, this SQL thing is going to be an update query. So update, and then I'm gonna say with unique generated keys of type UUID, which is something that Doobie supports. And the column that I'm going to use to generate there is going to be ID. So this ID column is a UUID supported by Postgres primary key default gen random UUID. So Doobie will take care to call this function for me. And after that, I'm going to say dot transact on the transactor. All right, so these are the implementations that I need for this particular core module, which is the jobs live. Okay, now I'm gonna go to a companion object. I'm gonna call this jobs live and I'm going to create an effectful constructor, make f, which is concurrent. Concurrent is a powerful type class in cat's effect. And this is gonna be uh, postgres as a uh, transactor, transactor f. This is going to be an F live job, jobs live, F. All right. And this is going to be 
uh, a pure because this doesn't allocate any resources of its own. So this is going to be a new jobs live F with Postgres. And uh, the constructor here is going to be private. Private. All right. And this is going to be new jobs live with Postgres dot pure F because we have, do we have, let me import cat syntax all star. And that should give us the pure method, right? So we have a success still. All right, so this is how we can build a new instance of Jobs Life. Let's test it out. So let's see how this works. Let me go to my database and uh, I'm going to truncate, truncate jobs. So this is gonna be an empty table and I'm gonna create a little application to demonstrate that this little core module works. So I'm gonna say objects, let's call this jobs. Uh, play ground extends io app that simple and i'm going to override the run method and in the run in the run method i'm going to use a transactor and i i need to build a transactor so i'm going to have let's call this make postgres make postgres as a for comprehension in Duby, you will need to run a for comprehension to return a transactor as a resource and that resource is built out of a, uh, an execution context. So this is going to be execution contexts, plural, from dubutil. Uh, I think it's fixed thread pool with the type IO from cat's effect with, let's say, I don't know, 32 threads. I don't know. Um, then you need a transactor. So the transactor, transactor. This is going to be from Hikari, transactor. And this is going to be... Transactor. Let's yield the transactor so that the compiler can help me. Hikari transactor is new Hikari transactor of type IO. And we need to pass in some values here. We need the driver class name. The driver class name is org.postgresql driver. This is a classical Java class. This is going to be the URL of the database, and this is going to be JDBC colon postgresql slash slash this is going to be localhost colon and i'm going to have to take a look at my docker compose yml to figure out the port and this is 5444 so it's 5444 then the username and password the username is docker the password is docker make sure to change those if you're doing any production work and the execution context, this is the thread pool. I should call this EC in case, uh, instead of CE. So this is gonna be the transactor, but this is a resource. Now with this resource, I will have to use that by providing or by creating a jobs live out of that and then using it to create some jobs. So I'm gonna have a little program. So def program, program which takes a Postgres as a transactor IO as an argument, and I'm gonna run a for comprehension. So for, I'm going to yield unit. I don't necessarily care about the result of the program. So given jobs as jobs live dot make with IO, so this is the effect type that you only instantiate at the end. And then I'm going to have a jobs dot create and we have job dot dummy which we already made a little bit earlier and then i'm going to have my list as jobs all and then i'm going to print them out so i'm going to have list and uh, i'm going to have an io io dot print print ln and i'm going to print this little list and this is going to be my little program and um, in my run method i'm going to say make Postgres, which is a resource and then use. And the use function takes a function from transactor to an IO. And I'm going to use program itself because this is a function from transactor to IO unit. All right, so that should in theory do the trick. Let's check the backend compile. Apparently it's working. All right, now given the jobs playground is a runnable application, let's go hit run have a bunch of exceptions here. Why no suitable driver? I think that's a red herring. Uh, warning, must contain a slash at the end of the host. And uh, that's gonna be me. So let me go save that, cut that out and run the app one more time. All right, seems to be working. 
So let's look at the output and look at that. We have a list with job, rock the JVM, instructor, scholar, teacher, and so on and so forth. Apparently this thing worked. And uh, if I select star from jobs, and apparently I do have one item here, which means that my little jobs module works correctly. All right, so this is my first core module. Obviously, you can create more core modules and unify them into one big case class that you can use to delegate different actions to. Type level write a passage, we have many, many, many core modules. I think we have more than a dozen that send emails and check out credit cards with Stripe and so on and so forth. So uh, obviously, that will be a little bit more complex, unified under a big core module. All right, now the next layer of our little demonstration is going to be the HTTP layer, which is going to serve as the HTTP API that the front end will use. So I'm going to create a little folder here. I'm going to have my HTTP. And under HTTP, we have a little class. And I'm going to call this job routes. All right. Now, this class job routes will also be typed with a type parameter f because we're dealing in this so called tagless final style. And uh, the effect type will depend on what kind of functionality we need inside. And this is going to be extending HTTP 4S DSL F. HTTP 4S DSL is something that gives us access to a nice little pattern match for matching routes. And I'm going to have a private val, let's call this prefix at slash jobs. And this is also going to have a private constructor with jobs as jobs F, depending on the layer underneath. All right, now I'm going to have a little private path Let's call this private val. Let's call this create job route. And this is going to be HTTP routes F. Now, I will need to import a bunch of things. Let me import cat's effect. Now, I'm going to import cat's syntax all. Going to import org.htp4s everything. And we have htp4s DSL. I'm also going to import implicits implicits. And maybe we would like to import some things that deal with JSON parsing. So I'm going to also import IO Cersei generic auto for type class derivation for encoding and decoding JSONs. And with these sort of imports, you're pretty much good to go for any sort of HTTP 4S route. Okay. Now, the create job route will look something like this. I would uh, create a post at slash jobs. So this is going to be a post at localhost 4040 slash jobs. And the payload is going to be a job instance. Now, the job instance is going to be a JSON object, which we're going to parse automatically as a job case class. So let me create my HTTP route. So this is going to be HTTP routes of F. And here, we're going to have the pattern match, the uh, cases that we're going to use for routes. Now, usually, routes one at a time, and each route will have a single case. So I'm going to have a case for uh, request. Let's call this req at post. And this is going to be at root slash. And uh, we're going to have, uh, for example, uh, create or something. So this is going to be post slash jobs slash create. And I'm going to, first of all, parse this little request as the case class. So I'm going to have a for comprehension. So I'm going to have a yield. For now, I'm going to yield nothing. And I'm going to have my job as the request as job. And the fact that I have access to the as extension method is given by the implicits and the IO Cersei generic auto thing. Um, I'm also going to import uh, a liaison between HTTP4S and Cersei. So I'm going to have my org HTTP4S Cersei, and then we have Cersei Cersei entity encoding Cersei entity codec dot star. So this allows us to parse HTTP requests as case class instances. So this is going to be a rec as job. Then I'm going to have my ID as jobs dot create. And uh, we have jobs F that I need to import. So I'm going to have import com rock the JVM live board core star. And I'm also going to import the domain. So domain job. So we have jobs dot create job. 
And the response is going to be a 201 created. So I'm going to have created with uh, not change list params created. This is going to be from the HP4SDSL. So created to uh, 201 with the ID that I've just uh, returned. So let's go save this. Hopefully that should do the trick. Let's check the back at compilation. Combrock the JVM live demo core domain, not core domain, just domain. All right, cool. No given instance of type cats monad f. All right, so let's do a monad here from cats effect. Let's go save. Now we have not found type monad. We have from cats. So import import cat star. Let's go do that. All right now we have two uh, two week type dependencies here. Cats dot monad throw. So let's do a monad throw instead. Okay, now we have cannot decode because no entity decoder instance could not be found, but no implicit values. That's probably because of another type class instance that I need to add. And look at that. No implicit values were found for cat's effect kernel concurrent f. So that's actually the type class instance that I need to be using there, concurrent. And with that, I should be good to go. Yield unit. I don't have yield unit. I need to yield the response. This is the thing that I want to return from my HTTP API. And now I have success. All right. So this is how I have my route ready. Now you can go forward to implement all your HTTP API. For example, I want to get at slash jobs, and that would that should give me all the lists of the entire list of jobs that I have currently. So I'm going to have a private val get all route. This is going to again an HTTP routes F, and this is going to be HTTP routes of F, and we have a case for get at root, and I'm going to have my job score module here, which I'm going to use to iterate. So I'm going to have jobs .all, and this is going to be an F list job, and I'm going to flat map that flat map, and given the list of jobs, I'm going to return an OK with those jobs. OK, and this is going to be a 200 OK with the payload with all these jobs. Now, after you're done with the entire HTTP API that you want to support, you'll expose a list of routes. So this is going to be routes as an HTTP routes F. And I'm going to use the router constructor, router, from org HTTP4S server. And router will have a prefix, prefix. And this is going to be a little map. So this is going to be an association between the path prefix, which is going to be slash jobs, and the combination of all these routes that I'm going to chain one by one. And uh, the chain is going to be in parentheses, create job route, and then get all route. And uh, this little squiggly um, operator here is the semigroup K addition, which is available from cats. So you can uh, combine HTTP routes as algebraic values here with a semigroup. Okay, cool. Now, after you've created the routes, it's time we start the application. So I'm going to create one. So inside this playground, I'm actually going to call this application. So application, and uh, I'm going to rename that and the object is going to be called application. Let's go save that. Apparently the compilation is still successful. Now in my application, I'm going to extend IO app dot simple. And in this IO app simple, I'm going to take whatever resource I, uh, I made for the jobs playground. So I'm going to take the make Postgres thing. That's a nice little resource that I'm going to use. Now in a real app, you would organize this code a little bit better, you can uh, put the database resource in some other file and just invoke that. But I'm just going to make them here because the application is very small. And I'm also going to make another resource, which is the server. So make server because the HTTP 4S uh, server is also exposed as a resource. So I'm going to have a fork comprehension. And I'm going to rely on this make Postgres thing. So I'm going to have Postgres as make Postgres. Then I'm going to instantiate my core module, which is just my jobs module for now. So I'm going to have a uh, resource dot and uh, resource is from cats effect. So I'm going to import cats effect everything. I'm going to cut the IO app. And here, because we're composing resources, would be a good idea for me to expose 
a resource smart constructor here. So I'm going to have resource f, which is higher kind of concurrent. Then we have postgres, which is transactor f. And this is going to be a resource with f and transact, not transactor, but jobs live f. And uh, this is going to be a resource dot pure with new jobs live f with postgres. So the same construct that I did earlier, new jobs live f postgres, instead of wrapping that in a pure effect, I wrap that in resource dot pure. Okay, so let me go do that. I'm going to say instead of resource, I'm going to say jobs live dot resource with type io with postgres. Now, I think I need some imports as well as some proper um, Scala syntax here. So we have execution contexts, Hikari transactor, and uh, jobs live. I think I need to import everything here. So import com rock the JVM, live demo core everything. That should give me jobs live. And we have object application. I need to override the run method and that should do the trick. All right, so at least the code compiles in this shape. Now I need an equivalent smart constructor for the job routes as well. So because this has a private constructor, I'm going to expose that in a companion object. I'm gonna call this job routes. And uh, this is gonna be a resource F, which is, I think it's concurrent. Let's check the type class, it is concurrent. And uh, we'll have jobs as jobs f as a constructor and this is going to be job routes f and uh, this is going to be resource dot uh, pure new job routes f with jobs as argument hopefully that should do the trick resource dot pure and i think oh uh, yeah i uh, i'm stupid because i need to expose a resource so resource f and job routes f, that's going to be my correct type. Okay, back to the application. Let's create my routes as job routes resource io with jobs. And I need to import everything from the HTTP package. So we have Postgres jobs and routes. Cool. Now, based on these routes, I need to create the server. So I'm going to have server as ember server builder. This is from HP4S. Ember server builder, default of type IO. Then I need with host with port. So with host. And I'm going to use a little library that would create optional values for me. So I'm going to have import com, comcast IP4S star. This exposes some nice custom interpolators. I'm going to show you how those look like. It's host quote. So host quote localhost or 0000, if you want to do that. And also with port, with port quote, uh, let's say 4041. And then with HTTP, HTTP app. And there I'm going to wrap my routes. So this is going to be my uh, routes dot routes. And this is going to be uh, job routes or job API job API dot routes or not found. This is going to be my HTTP app. And uh, if you want to also spin up a little front end, which will probably run or be served from another port, you'll need to wrap those in cores. And uh, cores is cross origin resource sharing. And this is important in development mode. So I'm going to have job API routes not found cores. I'm going to import as org HTTP for us middleware, whatever. So let me put these at the top. Okay. And then following this builder pattern, I'm going to say build. So this make server is a resource with IO and I'm going to expose the server. And this is a resource IO server, which I can then use in my main method saying may server, make server use. And given the server that I don't care about, I'm going to say IO print line, say rock the JVM server ready. And then I'm going to not stop the application. So I'm going to chain this little IO with this little squiggly and then operator with IO never. And that should be my main application. So this is the back end. Now, 
the backend compile apparently has a little success. Cool. So let's spin this up. So I'm going to go at the top, hit run. And look at that, we have Ruck the JVM server ready. The server is listening at 4041. Most job from the command line, because that sucks. I'm just going to check all the current jobs, like get all route. So this is going to be get at slash jobs, which I can then run from a regular terminal. So curl localhost 4041 slash jobs. And look at that, we have this little blob of text, which is a JSON array containing whatever we have in the table. That is great. So apparently the HTTP API works nicely. So we have the backend ready. And uh, I hope by now you understand the different layers here. We currently only have just two, which is the core built out of this jobs thing. And then we have the HTTP layer built out of the, just the job routes. Naturally, as you add more verticals into your application, you may want to add a little domain for that. You may want to add a core module, wrap those in some sort of uh, common core module that you can pass as dependency to a common HTTP API, which wraps job routes or user routes or whatever other routes you may want to add for the application. And then you'd spin them up under the main application in this for comprehension by building all your necessary resources, creating the server and having the server serve your app. Okay, so that would be the back end, at least in the initial scaffolded way. Let's check out the front end. Now, in order for us to do the front end, I'm going to kill my current server and I'm going to do a bit of refactoring because at least the domain model needs to be visible between both the front end and the back end. So I am going to, uh, in my common project and uh, under common, I'm going to create a little folder called shared. And uh, this is very important. So shared source main Scala com ruck the jvm live demo domain so the path here is very important so share the source main scala and then the same package com ruck the jvm live demo domain and in this folder in this domain thing i'm going to take the entire domain that i have including including my little job so let me go move that i'm going to ask the id to Leave me alone. And I'm gonna hit, I'm gonna kill the domain model from the server and I'm going to leave it there under the common package. Now, currently the app will break. So I'm going to, look at that. We have comrock the JVM live demo domain job. I'm going to save all the files and I'm going to ask SBT to still compile my code. So let's go to my backend compile. Let's hit control C and let's do a tilde compile again. And apparently this thing works. So I'm going to go to my application and I'm going to try running it again. And look at that. We have rocked the JVM server already. And if I hit a curl again, look at that. We have the application still working. So even after the refactor, the domain was now now compiled from the common package. So not from the server package, but from the common package. Now, this may confuse the ID, either Metals or IntelliJ, which is why I am going to restart the build server. And after a while, Metals or IntelliJ, depending on what you're using, should not give you that much red in the code. Apparently, Metals is still confused, but SBT is your source of truth. So this is why I have my backend compile here to tell me whether my code does compile. And apparently it does. So I am going to go with that and I'm going to navigate to the front end now. Now the front end is built out of a different mental model. I'm going to use Tyrion to build the little front end and it's time I showed you what the app contains. Now the app does contain some boilerplate um, code at the beginning, so I'm gonna walk you through very quickly. Package.json contains some NPM scripts and NPM dependencies for us to run this uh, as a a uh, plain JavaScript application locally. So this package.json requires that you use NPM and Node installed on your computer. So make sure you have those ready. So I am going to open up some front end. So front end, or actually I'm going to call this NPM. And in NPM, I'm going to use NPM install after you've navigated to the app directory. So go run NPM install. It shouldn't take too long because we have very few dependencies. 
And after that, after we build our very uh, simple Scala JS application, we're going to be able to serve this locally under a different port. Okay. Now, leave this to work until I describe what else we have here. We have an index.html currently containing just a plain HTML file. The relevant bit is here under body. So we're going to serve our Scala.js application as a module, which is called app.js. Now, this app.js is a plain JavaScript application that imports um, a little function that Scala.js will spit out for us, which I'm going to call Rock the JVM app. Now, this is going to be imported from target Scala 331 app.fastop.js. App so whatever Scala.js code we end up run, uh, writing, we're going to use the compiler to spit out this little JavaScript file. This is just one JavaScript file. It may end up quite big. And I'm going to import a function that's called ruck the JVM app. And this ruck the JVM app will have a little function inside of it, which is called launch. And it's going to render itself in the container that we called app in the HTML. So once the indexed HTML loads, it will look for app.js. The app.js will import this little function, and this function will be launched inside the app container in the index.html. So the app container in index.html is where all the Scala magic will happen. Okay. So these little things uh, are just boilerplates for us to be able to render this index.html. Currently, we have a package log.json. This is a new file, and this is the log file that npm has spit out for us after we hit npm installed. So look at that. And we're going to write our code inside the app, and I'm going to have a new folder, source, main, scala, com, rock the JVM. Let's call this live demo. And in this live demo, I'm going to create a scala file, an object that I'm going to call application. Now, the name of the object is not important. Important is to find, to match this little path. So source main Scala and then a package, com rock the JVM live demo. And inside another terminal, I am going to call this front end compile. And I'm going to put this right under back end compile. All right. So in front end compile, I'm going to do. Uh, create another SBT console. Shouldn't take too long. And I'm going to do project app. And I'm going to do tilde fast opt JS. This is the tilde compile, but the, just for front end. All right, so we have success. Now, this is just a plain object. Currently, it doesn't do anything. In order for us to actually work this application and render something on the front end, we need to follow a certain structure that Tyrion will give us. To call this application, I'm going to call this app for short. So this is going to be app.scala. Notice that uh, the fast.js has uh, figured this out very quickly. Okay. Now, for this to render anything on the, on the front end, I will need to uh, annotate this with at JS export top level. And look at that, we have some Scala.js imports. So Scala, Scala.js, JS annotation, JS export top level. So I'm going to um, add that. I'm also going to import Scala, Scala.js, JS. And I'm going to import annotation star. Okay, so JS export top level will export this whole object as a JavaScript function. So I'm going to have JS export uh, top level, and the name is important because that's how we declared it in app.js, and this is called rock the JVM app. So I'm going to have this name exported as a string. Okay. Now this object app needs to extend a little uh, trait called Tyrion app. So Tyrion app, and Tyrion app is typed with two type parameters. One is called message and one is called model. I'm going to describe what those are. I'm going to define the message type as an enum, msg, and I'm going to have a case nothing or no op or no msg, and I'm going to have a case class called model, and this model will have jobs as a list of job, for example. Now, I'm going to import job from my common domain, and if you are able to import this, it means that the common package, the common project in the app works nicely. Okay, and Tyrion app is something that is imported from the Tyrion library. So I'm going to import a bunch of things. I'm going to import Tyrion star, I'm going to import Tyrion HTML star, 
with a capital H, going to import Tyrion HTTP with a lowercase h. And I'm also going to import cat's effect. So I'm going to import cat's effect star. Okay, so this is just boilerplate for now. We have a bunch of imports. So we have cat's effect, Tyrion, Tyrion HTML, Tyrion HTTP. Now we have two types. One is a message type, which is a sum type. So this is an enum and the case class model, this is a product type. This contains a bunch of things. This is no coincidence. The Tyrion app has two type parameters. One is the message type and one is the model type. I'm going to describe how these work. Now, the Tyrion app trait needs to override a bunch of traits. One is called init and this has a bunch of flags and uh, we're not going to use them. We're going to return a tuple with the initial model and the model is the data that the JavaScript application currently holds at this point, and the first command that this will be triggered once you load the application. I'm going to describe how commands work shortly. For now, I'm going to uh, return a plain tuple with model containing no jobs and cmd.none. So nothing happens. CMD is a wrapper over cat's effect IO. So this is just an effectful operation that you can trigger. Now, before I override the rest of the methods, and the methods are update, subscriptions, and view, I need to tell you a little bit about how Tyrion works. So Tyrion works on this little model thing, which is a little piece of data that the Scala.js application will have access to. Based on this model, you'll render something on the page. For example, if you have a list of jobs, you'll render a list of cards on the front end. So the model model triggers what is being rendered on screen. Naturally, given the model, we're going to render the view function. So the view function will be triggered automatically by Tyrion app whenever the model has changed. So whenever the model has changed, the view function will be re-triggered and Tyrion will render something else on screen. So it's our job to change the model depending on what we need to be rendered on screen. Okay, so the second method that we're going to override here, override, is the view. So given the model, we're going to render some HTML on the page. For example, I'm going to render a div, and I'm going to have model, jobs, map, and as children of this div, I'm going to iterate over all of these jobs, or rather transform this list of jobs into a list of divs. So this is going to be a div with, uh, given the job, I'm going to render a little div. So let me use nicer syntax here. So given a job inside, I'm going to render job dot to string, for example. So given the model, I will render something on screen. If the model changes, or rather if the list of jobs changes, then the view will also be triggered and this will render something else on the screen. So naturally, we'll need to know how we can ever update the model. And this is our next function. So I'm going to override the update method. Okay, now this is where things get tricky. Updates will happen as a reaction to a message. So give it the message, you will return a new model and maybe a command that may send a new message just to have uh, front ends that are currently or continuously active. So for example, this message can be something relevant to changing this model. What can that be? For example, I'm going to have a case for load jobs with jobs as a list of job. And a case for error, error as a string. So this model can either show an error or either contain an error or it can contain a list of jobs. So this model can be arbitrarily complex and the message can be arbitrarily complex as the number of possibilities depending on what you want to render on the screen. So this is a potential list of messages that you might want to send. Now, who sends those messages? Wait for a bit. I'm going to have a message and I'm going to say message match. And I'm going to have a case for all of these messages. For case no MSG, case for error, and another case for msg.loadjobs with jobs. 
Okay, now with no MSG, I'm just going to ret return the same model. So I'm going to have the model and a command, and that's going to be CMD none. So no command ever. In case of error, maybe we want to display something. Maybe we want to change the model with something that will then trigger the view and uh, trigger a little pop-up saying uh, error, something went wrong. But I'm just going to return the same thing. I don't want to treat errors for now. Now, the only in, uh, interesting thing, the only interesting message here is load jobs. Now, in case we have a message that has just been received of type load jobs, maybe I want to append these jobs to the current jobs that are stored in the model. So I'm going to have model copy and uh, I'm going to have uh, jobs equals, let's say, list as model jobs plus plus the list. And command.none. Okay, so given a message, I'm going to return a new model and maybe a new command. And if the model has changed, then the view function will be triggered automatically by Tyrion. Okay, so that's update. We also have view and then we have subscriptions. So I'm going to have override subscriptions. And this is a sub which is an FS2 uh, stream. So this is a wrapper of an FS2 and I'm going to have sub none. I don't care about subscriptions for now. Subscriptions can be things like notifications or web sockets or even um, browser events like page changes so that you can render single page applications. This is what we are actually doing in the type of a write a passage. We have a little subscriber so or subscription that listens for browser change events and then we're rendering something else on screen so that we're uh, taking care of the HTML5 push states uh, API. All right, so that we don't uh, ruin the UI. Okay, now currently, the way that the code currently stands, there's nobody to send any sort of message ever. So we have command none, command none, command none. So there's nobody to issue any sort of message at all. We could trigger a command when the page is rendered at the beginning. For now, let's just compile this app and we're going to render uh, something on screen. So I'm going to have div maybe a text or p with uh, this is the first uh, Scala JS app and then model jobs map whatever and uh, this model is by default an empty list. All right so let's just compile this app and I think I messed something up because the uh, API interior allows us to uh, create elements with two argument lists. The first argument list is the set of attributes, for example, the CSS class. And the uh, CSS class or any sort of HTML attribute can be written like this with the colon equals. For example, I'm going to use row here. And then you can pa pass in the children. And the children cannot be expanded like that, but I'm going to have another div with uh, class contents. And as my second argument list, I'm going to have my list of children like this and hopefully that should do the trick all right so we have a success and this is how the view thing looks like okay now let's make this work so we have front-end compile currently we have the application compiling npm has just installed now we would like to build the javascript and render the html so i'm going to say npm run start and the start command is specified in package.json. So the start script will be run when you say npm run. So hit that, npm run start, and this should serve at localhost 1234. Now, if you navigate to localhost 1234, you should. This is the first Scala.js app, which is the exact text that we wrote in app. So this is the first Scala.js app, and this can be changed automatically. So if you say by rock the JVM, if you save this, then the front-end compile will trigger another front-end compile for JavaScript. NPM will pick the new JavaScript, and then it will serve the JavaScript again. So this is the first Scala.js app by Rock the JVM. So the development experience is quite nice because as you change anything in the Scala code, the web application will also just re-render. All right, cool. Now, let's trigger our first backend call as a command and issue the first message as a response from the backend. And that will conclude our little demonstration here. And uh, I'll leave you to it. And I'm going to have a little function. Let's call this backend call. 
back in call. And this is going to be a, a command of type IO from Cat's Effect and MSG. And I'm going to use a little function from Tyrion, HTTP.send. And uh, I'm going to have an HTTP request. So request, request.get, and then you'll pass in the actual URL of the server. So this is going to be HTTP slash slash localhost 4041 slash jobs. This is going to be the request that returns all the jobs. And then you'll need to pass a decoder uh, to decode the response into a message that will be automatically sent and put through the update function. So that's the general idea. And this is going to be a decoder from Tyrion HTTP, decoder MSG. And this decoder has two functions as argument. From the HTTP response, response, you'll need a message. And error, you'll need a message. So from the response, I'm going to use Cersei, and I'm going to use Cersei to parse this manually. So I'm going to uh, import IO Cersei uh, syntax, everything. I'm also going to import IO Cersei parser star. That should do the trick. Uh, I'm also going to import IO Cersei generic auto so that I have access to the Cersei type class instances for my case classes, in my case, the job. I'm going to use Cersei to parse this manually. So I'm going to use parse. This is from Cersei. Response.body. This is going to be a plain string. And, uh, parse returns uh, a little, uh, I think it's a cursor, or a JSON object. Okay, JSON object. Then flat map, flat map, and I'm going to say underscore as list job. And this is going to be an either containing an error or the list of jobs. So I'm going to say match. And in case we have a left with an error, I'm going to issue a message dot error with e get message. In case we get a write with a list of jobs, I'm going to have msg load jobs with this list. So I'm going to issue a backend call. When I get a response, this function will be triggered and this will emit a message depending on the logic that I have inside. And in case I get an error, I'm going to have an msg dot error. And uh, I'm going to have e dot to string. And I'm going to put a comma here because this is my second argument. So the backend call is going to be issued as a command, and this will trigger a backend call. And when that backend call returns, the body of that will be parsed under this logic, and this message will be emitted and subject to this update function, which Tyrion will automatically route to us. So that's the general idea. Cool. Now, I need to use this backend call as a command. This is, again, a wrapper over cat's effect IO, and this is going to be the command that I'm going to issue at init. You can also trigger this command as a reaction to a click on a button or things of that sort. I'm going to keep it simple. and I'm going to use this backend call as my first command. So once the application loads on the page, it will trigger the backend call. When the backend call returns, this logic will be run. This message will be emitted. And when the message is emitted, the update function is called. It will update the model, which in turn will update whatever is being viewed on the page. That's the general idea. So let me go save the app. Let's navigate here very quickly. And after the compiler is done, this should trigger our first backend call, but apparently I have a compiling error. So front end compile msg error e to string. Where is that? msg, not e, but error. All right. All right, we have a success. Look at that. So we have our first job which we can use to render something on screen. So I'm going to increase my font sizes here and also on the page. And I'm going to go to my network tab. If I refresh the page, look at that. We have the jobs API being called whenever the page is being first rendered on screen. So this is HTTP localhost 4041 slash jobs. And with this data, you can decide to do something with it. Maybe you want to render a little nice card saying this is a new job. Rock the JVM, instructor, rock the JVM.com, and so on and so forth. You can display this data in a nice way. And then you can go on to render your front end. 
So that was a quick demonstration of how you can scaffold a full stack skull application with a type level stack. I hope you liked this video. If you did, go ahead and click the like button and subscribe to the channel for more videos like this. And check out the website for everything in the Scala ecosystem and more. And check out the type level rite of passage if you want to build a production grade full stack skull application for yourself or for your job. Until next time, folks, this is Daniel signing off.